Good morning, security gang. Welcome to another episode of the Cyber Hub Podcast. The show's just about to get started. I'm going to go make my espresso and we'll get the show going. Don't go anywhere. Cyber Hub Bunker and Studio. You're tuning in to the Cyber Hub Podcast. And now for your host and CISO, James Azar. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, Thursday, March 2nd, this morning, the White House released its national cybersecurity strategy. And while I covered it on the practitioner brief this morning, I wanted to give you a more in-depth analysis after reading 39 pages in this document and looking at them from the perspective of a practitioner uh, from the work I do on the Hill with legislatures with legislators and as well as a American citizen. What does it, what does this national cybersecurity strategy really mean? Um, and we're going to get into that here. We're going to get into it because specifically if you're a, a chief information security officer, if you're, in leadership, in information security, this document is kind of the basis of what we're about to go through um, over the next two two to four years. It's the strategy that's been set upon, um, and this document's been done since President Obama. Uh, first one was 2000, I believe, and nine or 2010. Um, it wasn't updated during the Obama terms from the first time they released the document and don't quote me on the dates here. Um, um, I know that president Trump um, had his own cybersecurity strategy as well. And now two years into the uh, president, president Biden's administration, this document's now coming forth um, with a lot of detail. So there's five pillars to this, but we'll let's go ahead and kind of kick off and I'm doing an on-screen review with all of y'all. So uh, some stuff's already been highlighted stuff that I want to talk about stuff that I think is is, is is valuable, like the cybersecurity is essential to the basic functioning of our economy, the operational of our critical infrastructure. Everyone understands tech is critical, tech is important, and cybersecurity is a critical part of that. Cybersecurity is no longer an IT function. It's no longer a data function. It's no longer a network function. It is a fully business operational function. It is critical, and it's essential to the basic functioning of, of all aspects of business. You can no longer look at a CISO uh, based on this this one sentence and say, you report to the CIO, deal with the IT security side, and that's it. In Based on this document and based on many others, but now based on the realities of how this document shapes national security, national cybersecurity strategy, you look at this and make the argument that a CISO should be reporting to the CEO or the board, potentially a, maybe even the risk officer, because there's risk in here is a lot of times. Um, I didn't count but it's in here a whole bunch of times and security is a business function rather than just an IT function. And any business that doesn't get it 
if they read this, if you communicate this effectively, they'll understand it, they'll get it, they'll, they'll go ahead and go there. So let's go ahead and talk about the five pillars that are part of the uh, national cybersecurity strategy, defending critical infrastructure, disrupting and dismantling threat actors, shape market uh, forces to drive security and resilience, invest in a resilient future, and forge international partnerships to pursue shared goals. Then there's a page and a half of implementation. So there's about, I'd say, um, 20 some odd pages that are all about theory. A lot of it is stuff all of you have known, been talking about, heard. Um, and then there's about a page and a half of implementation. This is what we hope to do to do all of this. <laughs> and then I, and I move to the word hope. One of the emerging trends here is that the, the more uh, technologies that are emerging, and we've obviously unlocked uh, new possibilities, but then again, they've also uh, introduced systematic risk uh, because of insecure systems. You can look at IoT as being one of those. Um, new technology, quantum computing around the corner, um, AI, all of these play an aspect to it. Now, on, on, on page seven of the document, they talk about malicious actors. And they point out to four really big ones. China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and other autocratic states with revisionist intent are aggressively using cyber capabilities to pursue objectives. There's a whole paragraph on the People's Republic of China. Uh, and they present the broadest and most active and most persistent threat to both government and private sectors. Um, and this is a something very, very wealth wor worthwhile to present to business, especially if your company does business in China, over how do you segregate and potentially change the way you operate in China from anywhere else in the world, meaning two different source codes, two different environments, two everything is separate, everything is different. So the Chinese really have no way. I try to eliminate the common core um, from, from, from that, that side of the business. There's also the idea of Russia here. And, and I didn't highlight Russia because the press is doing a good enough job talking about Russia. But where I do want to talk about next is Iran and the, and, and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea um, are, are similarly growing in sophistication and willingness. They're, they're not. They're powered by China. And that's one thing this document fails to talk about is the fact that Iran and, and North Korea are now powered by China. Their cyber capabilities are powered by China. Their cyber objectives and their payments are powered by China. A, a lot of things are powered by China. And so the fact that it's not part of this document is a big miss. But the fact that they're highlighting these four uh, uh, governments is essentially kind of, this is the equivalent of George Bush's axis of evil. Fair? The, that, that would be... Our, our comparison. So there's two foundational shifts to these pillars, uh, responsibilities and resources in cyberspace, and additionally, allocation of roles. That's one thing this document fails um, to do. They talk about the rebalancing of the responsibility to defend cyberspace, and yet the government here has a whole slew of just things that don't make any sense, and I'll explain. They want to build on existing policy, including the Office of the National Cyber Directorate, in addition to the National Security Council. All very valid. Uh, they talk about all the different executive orders here. They're setting all the precedent. Anytime you read a government document, there's a whole bunch of precedents, a whole bunch of stuff that's kind of setting forth the strategy, saying, we didn't make this stuff up. This has been happening for a lot of times. Here's this executive order. Here's this executive order. Here's this government policy. Here's this government rule. Here's this law. And here's how we funded it. Here's what we've done. And that's really page 10 of this is really the history. And then we get into pillar one, defending critical infrastructure. And all in all, it's fine. They mentioned the Russia-Ukraine war and, and the Russian attack in Ukrainian critical infrastructure. They did. They didn't attack any other critical infrastructure outside of countries that supporting the Ukraine within the European bloc. Uh, but federal agencies that support critical infrastructure providers must enhance their own capabilities and their abilities to collaborate with other federal entities. And this is where this stuff gets a little complex. There's so many federal entities. And we're going to get to that in just a minute. I've highlighted that piece, and I'll be talking about it here in just a moment, so I'm not going to bore you with the details there. When an inc incident occurs, they want stuff kind of really coordinated between state, local, tribal, and territorial partners which is fine, but then most states don't really have robust cyber forces. I mean, New York, Florida, 
Georgia potentially, California somewhat, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Washington State, and Texas are the only ones that really have any sort of cyber force from a state level with resources. All the other states pretty much look at the federal government and rely on them for assistance. The administration is committed to improving federal cybersecurity through long-term efforts to implement a zero-trust architecture strategy and modernize IT and OT infrastructure. Now, that's great. We're bringing up zero trust. Zero trust is the government keyword. That's the a policy they want to go after. That's fine. It's a sound policy. I was a detractor at this point. I'm not fully bought in, but I definitely can respect the argument and see its benefits. And therefore, I'm, I'm just going to lay off of that. What I will say is if you're going to modernize IT and OT infrastructure, you've got to have money and a plan to do it. And you've got to have the right people behind it doing it. And unfortunately, in this document, none of that is highlighted. None of that is discussed. Now we get to the point where we talk about regulation. They want to establish regulation. And really, that's what this document's all about. At the end of the day, the national cybersecurity strategy is all about we're going to add a whole slew of regulations to regulate cybersecurity and make you pay for security or otherwise hold you accountable for it. Either we'll hold the operators or the, or the creators, but someone's going to be held liable and the government stands to make fines and more bodies to overlook this. And then I think that's the challenge. And now we get to the idea of the administration's made progress by establishing cybersecurity requirements in key sectors such as oil and natural gas, aviation and rail, led by TSA and water systems, led by the EPA. TSA, for those who don't know, are the same people that tell you, take your laptop, take your shoes off, and your belt off at the airport. Yep, those individuals, that agency is somehow responsible for cybersecurity requirements across oil and natural gas pipelines, aviation, and rail. When, when in fact, we have CISA, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Literally, their entire mission is around infrastructure security. That's their mission. And wouldn't oil and gas fall under critical infrastructure according to the federal government database? It would. Additionally, aviation and rail, yes, absolutely. They're part of the transportation. Why is TSA doing this? Why are we spreading this across so many federal agencies where coordination between these agencies gets really, really hard because of interagency funding requirements, because of the politics, the dirty politics that are played in D.C. that end up costing the American taxpayer, American citizens, and American corporations all of the burden. And this document does nothing to fix it. The first thing you should have done right here is talking about establishing requirements, centralize everything under one body. Let one body run center. Let everyone else react. Fund TSA to support um, organizations under its jurisdiction, but let one body oversee it. Instead, TSA is trying to create a policy. EPA is trying to create cyber policy. EPA, these are the people that tell you whether the air or water is safe to drink, right? And CISA is trying to come up with something. NSA is doing their own thing. FBI is trying to investigate. Secret Service is working on this as well. And DOD is trying to establish a, a, a defense strategy around this. All in all, it's a cluster F, and it remains that way with this document. Additionally, they're talking about states and independent regulators having authorities that can be used to set cybersecurity requirements. So not only do they want to do this on the federal level, they're saying, if we potentially can do it on the federal level, hey, states, do that. So not only do we have 50-some-odd different data breach notification laws at this point in the books, and that's a hefty cost of a cyber incident is, is really the lawyers notifying every single state attorney of the breach, which every state has different requirements and different guidelines. And so that's a costly process because lawyers cost money. Um, one, number two, let's add more regulation in these businesses because God knows we as practitioners don't have enough regulations. All this does is it sets bad precedent for practitioners. I don't need more regulatory supervision. I don't need more rules. What I need is support. What I need is partners. And this document talks a lot about private-public partnership, but it fails to show anything the government's willing to do and contribute to that partnership in its current form. They want to harmonize and streamline new and existing regulations. Well, stuff that's conflict or duplicative or overly uh, burdensome Regulators must work together to minimize these. Come on. The SEC is going to come up with a rule. The FTC is going to come up with a rule. Everyone's EPA, TSA, CISA, 
everyone's going to come up with a rule and no one's going to talk to anyone. The fact that you say this means nothing to these agencies. They see additional regulation as a way to get more money, as a way to secure their sheer existence and give themselves additional workforce. This isn't helping. A national cybersecurity strategy should be around centralizing around DHS or DOD and having that policy go out to different agencies with areas of responsibility to build a private-public partnership from that agency level, meaning have an up-top agency that's setting out the rules, the policies, working with Congress around regulations and funding, right? Then have TSA work with its partners and give TSA money to work with their partners on this, but don't let them set the regulation. Don't let them have to oversee that. Um, so, again, enabling regulated entities to afford security, talking about potentially funding them. Uh, there's also scaling public-private relationships through the uh, secure risk uh, management agencies, the SR, um, SRMAs and the ISOs and ISACs. All of that is, is in here on this one. And also uh, creating the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative at CISA. And here we go. So you've got CISA that's running the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative. And you've got the federal government and private sectors coming together to create the National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force. Why is CISA not running this at the very, very top? Why do they not have this jurisdiction? Why isn't CISA given all the power here? That's literally their name, Cybersecurity Infrastructure. It's in their name. I'm frustrated by this. I felt like this was a big miss, a huge miss, an opportunity to eliminate a lot of waste, an opportunity to centralize everything, to allow cybersecurity to function without all these different bodies and all the, the more people you add to the table, the more complex things get. Obviously, the CERCIA, the uh, uh, Cyber Incident Reporting for uh, Critical Infrastructure Act that passed last year is being mentioned here uh, with, with, with the timelines and, and as well as collective defending uh, federal civilian agencies uh, with the responsibility of managing and securing there are IT and OT systems, um, as well as coming up with funding for that as well. So we move on to pillar number two, disrupting and dismantling threat actors. And here we get to DOD creating a strategy. So TSA is creating one regulatory strategy. EPA will create another one for a whole different sector. Um, Congress will do one of its own that will probably be nationwide. Um the federal government will put a bunch of executive orders around this. But now for dealing with adversaries, we pass this off to Cyber Command and DOD and how they're going to integrate it and post strategic level threats to U.S. interests and how they're going to disrupt that. But bringing this together brings a more cohesive approach to our national security. The U.S. is 50 different countries in one. The U.S. has 50 different ways to be superior to any other country. And yet we don't take advantage of that. We don't, we're just so dismembered. The federal government's just a mess when it comes to this. Um, they're also encouraging uh, private sector partners to come together, organize their efforts through one or more nonprofit like the National Cyber Forensics and Training Alliance as well. So um, preventing abuse of US-based ecosystems. They're often talking about foreign resellers that have multiple degrees of separation from their US-based providers. Um, and, and that's creating a threat, essentially, uh, a bunch of resellers, someone legitimate buying our tax, selling it to someone else, internationally selling it to someone else. And there's so many degrees of separation, you don't even know uh, threat actors are operating in your environment and leveraging your tech. And then so they want to increase and prevent this abuse. And so they're wanting to put more controls in place to that. Highly welcome. Very, very good. As well, talking about ransomware. So on ransomware, they want to counter cybercrime, go against ransomware by leveraging international cooperations. The challenge is ransomware starts in Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, all countries that don't have that don't really comply with norms. So that's kind of pointless unless those people that you can identify go on vacation somewhere where you can actually grab them. And then the political pressure from the Chinese and the Russian doesn't let that country let those criminals go back to Russia. Investigating ransomware crimes and using law enforcement and other authorities to disrupt these obviously bolstering critical infrastructure resilience and addressing the abuse of virtual currency to launder ransom payments. This is the part where they're going to come after virtual currencies. They're just laying the ground foundation to this. This is the beginning argument to 
we can't have bitcoins or bitcoin's got to be regulated it's got to be part of a central bank type of deal which is it's coming soon but just keep your eyes on it they also talk about aml and kyc and, and, and a whole bunch of different standards uh, there as well and that's fine now we get to pillar three shaping market forces to drive security and resiliency to build a more secure and resilient future they need to shape market forces to place responsibility within the digital ecosystem to reduce risk they want to shift the consequences of poor cybersecurity away from the most vulnerable to the people who create it meaning if you're creating a vulnerable software and you're knowingly deploying that vulnerable software we're going to come after you they want to hold the stewards of our data accountable for the protection of personal data drive the de development of more secure connected devices and reshape laws that govern liability for data losses and harms caused by cybersecurity errors, software vulnerabilities, and other risks created by the software digital technology. This is a big one right here because this is really, this might be the one pillar that goes into the root cause of some of our cybersecurity challenges. Poor development, cutting corners, putting products out there with known vulnerabilities that you know have known vulnerabilities and not really addressing them we saw that with Kia and Hyundai, right? They they had issues with the, where their cars were getting stolen uh, just by simply plugging in a USB port. It was available on TikTok since July. They did nothing about it until now because insurance providers stopped paying the uh, owners of the cars their insurance claims when their cars got stolen, saying, go talk to Hyundai, go talk to Kia. There's class action lawsuits by them. And by the way, who owns a Hyundai and a Kia? Typically, it's it's people in, in the lower middle class or, or lower class because they're the most affordable vehicles that most people can get. It's typically a first or second car or, you know, someone's car that they're using to get to job one, job two, whatever the case may be. And so these are the people that are being impacted. And Kia and Hyundai kind of was just like, well, who cares? Uh, and I don't know. I haven't seen that, but, but I was very frustrated. I was speaking to a good buddy of mine by the name of Reggie. And him and I were sharing that because he's been following it for a while. We both agreed, like, how is this not addressed in a software update within 30, 40, 50 days? How does it take eight months to fix it? When it's a TikTok challenge and people are stealing your cars on TikTok, and you obviously see it because you advertise and use TikTok to promote your brand. So this is the kind of stuff where I actually feel like this is where uh, Pillar 3 is where the White House gets it right. Um, they're talking about supporting legislation to, to uh, impose robust, clear limits on the ability to collect, use, transfer. So a privacy bill, and they want to look at the guidelines established by NIST for that. Very, very welcome. I know uh, uh, my friends at the NTSC and Patrick Gall would love to see that happen this Congress or next Congress before the next presidential election. Also talking about the IoT cybersecurity through federal research and R&D procurement, as well as executive orders. This is great. Um, again, one more thing to get right, talking about IOT, talking about setting a standard and not releasing IOT devices that are, that are completely vulnerable. And then they get to what I think is the main statement of the day. And I think this is where, again, they get it right. Too many vendors ignore best practices for secure development, ship products with insecure default configurations or known vulnerabilities or integrate third-party software of unvetted or unknown province. Software makers are able to leverage their market position to fully disclaim liability by contract, further reducing their incentive to follow secure by design principles or to perform pre-release testing. Good job and well done. Credit is where credit is due. They get it here. They're going to start to shift that liability. I think once you see that, we'll start to see patch dues. They go from 70, 80, 100, 200, 300 different vulnerabilities down to 30. I think I'll say this, if pillar three is followed to the T, if anything gets executed on this, it's pillar three, we'll live in a more secure world just right then and there. This administration wants to work with Congress. This has got to be bipartisan, right? There's no reason why anyone would, 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 would say no to this, right? I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. There's some things we can agree on. I think most of us agree on 90% of, of, of things, and then that 10% gets overblown because the media wants ratings and clicks, right? So don't believe everything you see on social media and in the media. It's all BS. At the end of the day, here's what you've got. This is bipartisan, pass bills, pass liability laws that says if you sell something knowingly, and by the way, make sure the people in these organizations are covered as part of the whistleblower program. So if something like this happens, like what happened with Boeing, the 
that software that crashed two planes and took the lives of nearly 480 people, whistleblowers can come forward and talk about the lack of safety, the uh, cutting corners, and knowingly doing these things would go a long way towards securing our digital realm. And this finally addresses the root cause of some of our challenges. They're also going to prioritize R&D spending and programs and leveraging a federal procurement to prove accountability and explore a federal cyber insurance backstop to essentially support cyber insurance uh, for, for organizations while these things take place. And so uh, pillar three, magnificent. Pillar four, talking about going again and addressing things at the root cause. Pillar three, pillar four, finally, I think get to the meat and bones. I wish there was more of this. Talking about the, I, the the urgency to mitigate the most urgent of these pervasive concerns, like the BGP protocols, unencrypted DNS requests, and slow adoption of IPv6. All great. They realize this is going to be a big cleanup effort, and they want to put together a collaboration to get this cleanup effort started. Again, great. I love this. Um, this was one of the things that I really got excited reading. Preparing for a post-quantum future. Again, right on the mark um, as well. Magnificent, supporting the development of a digital identity system. How do we start to secure with digital banking? In my most recent role, I was a system for a digital bank. When we launched in October of last year, right, we had fraud within weeks, um, within days of launching, uh, digital identity fraud, people using uh, synthetic IDs or stealing identity and opening bank accounts online. So all these things matter. These people steal money. They're um, causing losses to organizations and they're increasing the cost of doing business and we all end up paying for it. So the idea of trying to find some sort of digital identity ecosystem to unite and confirm something that I don't want to say is, isn't hackable, but something that cre establishes defense in depth around your digital identity is critical. And the federal government wants to look at that and are looking for solutions that's, again, another great thing they get here. Also talking about workforce development, like the whole human cyber initiative. Uh, my buddy Paul, Leah, Christophe, uh, Christophe Fallon, the work that they're doing with NICE and educating the next uh, uh, cyber security workforce. Again, absolutely, definitely needed. And finally, our, our final pillar here, um, and in the two and a half minutes I have left, I'll just say this. We have multiple processes like the United Nations Group of Governmental Experts, open-ended working groups. Here's the thing. Here's my idea. Y'all know this. If you've watched a show, if you've seen any of, any of my 1,100 <laughs> different podcasts, I don't believe that the UN or NATO have any sort of backbone to stand for this kind of stuff. Typically, it takes the United States being overly aggressive with the Department of Justice and FBI that are willing to go after and put the country's leadership on the on the on on notice that if you don't cooperate, we're going to come after you. Now, this doesn't work with Russia and China, Iran and North Korea. But obviously, when a Russian hacker ends up in Spain, he gets arrested. We get to get him. We get to extradite him to the U.S. to face charges. That's magnificent. We want to be able to do the same in Asia. But NATO and the U.N. isn't a way to do this. The way to do this is to look at how do you take away from China and Russia's economy. You build an alliance. You build an alliance with India. You build an alliance with Pakistan. You build an alliance with Vietnam, with Cambodia, with Bangladesh, with all these different countries that could be part of securing a supply chain, can also provide bits and pieces, but also share a common uh, interest of, of, of democracy and, 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 and open society without you know building some sort of digital uh, um you know, kind of like a digital dictatorship per se. Um, and, and you build it with them and, and you go outside the UN because the UN is just full of statements. The UN to me is worthless. It's done nothing since its inception. It's taken, you know, I'm sorry. I, I, I've, I haven't seen the UN stop a war. I haven't seen the UN stop genocide. And you can go look back over the last 30 years and tell me when, when, when they did it. Um, Rwanda genocide was ongoing for, for, for years before anyone got involved. The same thing happened in Kosovo and, and former Yugoslavia uh, between the Serbs and the Kosovo and the Albanians. The same happened in Syria uh, just, just 20 years ago. Like zero. Yeah, sanctions. Yeah, we all go out and get to give a feel-good statement and it makes good headline and it reads well in a newspaper, but that's where that ends. And I think in order to do this properly, we've got to find like-minded nations, the US, UK, Ireland, Israel, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, uh, Brazil, uh, all the EU nations, Belgium, 
um, all 28 EU nations. I'm not going to name them all, right? Uh, potentially um, India, Turkey, getting all these countries on board and, and just creating a, uh, repercussions against the countries that really promote this and hold them accountable. So overall, I'll tell you this to wrap. It's a solid strategy. It's missing the mark because they're wanting to go after reg- regula- more and more and more regulation without centralizing it. Meaning if you want to do regulation and force um, and, and go to companies and say, we're going to regulate the fact that you've got to practice good cybersecurity. Wonderful. Just have one body do it. Don't have TSA and the EPA and the SEC and the FTC and all these different bodies. Here's what this does for many of us practitioners. It adds more complexity to our ability. And then we've got to decide how we're going to spend the little money we get or the money that we do have over compliance, over security. And that's a challenge. That's a challenge that's very, very hard to navigate times, especially in an economy like ours today where budgets are not increasing or being cut. Workforces aren't increasing or being cut. Skills are harder to come by. Make this more operational. I think the overall idea is good. It's a good national cybersecurity strategy overall. Lots of room for improvement, and hopefully the next one will look better than this one. That's it. That's my breakdown for this. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Make sure to subscribe. Make sure to follow the podcast on your favorite podcast listening platform. Thanks for spending the last 30 minutes with me here. Any comments, put them in the comment section. Follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Ping me. Happy to have a discussion. Happy to hear other opinions. I don't think I know everything. If I missed something here and you think, James, you missed something big, you may have not read it correctly, may have not understood it, happy to get those clarifications. I don't think I know everything. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. And stay cyber safe. We love feedback. So make sure to connect with us on social media and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast listening platform.